Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Season-Long Grub Control. This is brought to you by our sponsor, New Farm. I'm Allison Barwas from North Coast Media, digital editor of Landscape Management Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we begin, I'm going to go over some ways that you can participate during today's presentation. Although you are currently in a listen-only mode, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in the lineup. You can also submit questions via Twitter by using the hashtag BYBWebinar. Questions that were submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists, and may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of Landscape Management Magazine or in one of our e-newsletters. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. In addition, you can earn one CEU toward Planet Landscape Industry Certified recertification by watching this webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, Use the same question and answer box at the bottom left to tell us about your issue and click Submit. And Assistant Producer Bethany Chambers or I will personally assist you. Finally, a recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow afternoon at landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. You can, get that, you can get to that page now and bookmark it by clicking on the header above your slides. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. Now, I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, Landscape Management Editor, Marisa Palmieri. Thank you, Allison, and welcome everyone to the second session in our 2015 series of Build Your Business webinars. We have two great speakers lined up to cover the management uh, side and best practices related to season-long grub control. So I'll introduce our speakers and thank our sponsor before we get started. <clears throat> so first, thanks to New Farm, our sponsor, for making today's webinar possible. We have Rod Marquard, National, Lung, um, sorry, National LCO and Key Accounts Manager from New Farm on the line to say a few words. So Rod. Thank you, Marisa. This is a great topic. Grows may certainly be a challenge and an opportunity in turf in almost all markets and regions across the country. As the National LCO and Key Accounts Manager for New Farm, I am dedicated to working with the lawn and landscape industry and helping the landscape operator find solutions for pests such as grubs. New Farm is the manufacturer of a large portfolio of insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides, including such grub control products as Arena and Mallet. We at New Farm are very excited to be a part of the Landscape Management Webinar Series, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from today's speakers. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance. Thank you, Rod. Now let's say hello to our speakers. First up is Dave Shetler. Dave, also known as the Bug Doc, is a professor of urban landscape entomology at The Ohio State University, where he performs outreach and turf and ornamental entomology. He teaches technical, I'm sorry, he teaches general entomology and concentrates on turf grass entomology research. He was a research scientist with Chemlon Services from 1984 to 1990, and he joined Ohio State in 1990. He's co-authored several books on turf grass insects, and he has a long list of research and outreach publications. Following Dave, we'll hear from Brad DeBells, Director of Operations for Weedman Lawn Care in Middleton, Wisconsin. Brad is a 16-year veteran of the green industry with more than 11 years of experience at golf courses across Wisconsin, five years completing a master's degree and PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in soil science uh, and turf management, and now he is with Weedman in Middleton, Wisconsin. He's responsible for all field operations at um, the Green Bay, Madison, Milwaukee um, locations in Wisconsin, and then two, loca two offices in Illinois. So very excited to hear from bro both Dave and Brad today. Um, and with that, we will bring on Dave to get started. 
Thanks, Marissa. Uh, and again, I want to thank uh, New Farm for uh, sponsoring this and, and for uh, landscape management uh, sort of tending to the details of, of getting this uh, up and running. I guess the, the first thing that I'd like to mention, even though we're, this particular webinar is on white grub uh, and, and prevention of white grubs, uh, the reality is, is that we have a lot of other insects that do attack the turf grass. And in many cases, what we'll find is that when you make a, a preventive application for white grubs, you may affect some of these other insects. And I was kind of interested in the uh, questions that arrived prior to this webinar that uh, there's uh, obviously we run from the east coast to the west coast and from north to south. Uh, and the reality is is that uh, there are other people that will be dealing with mole crickets primarily in the southern parts of, of the uh, country. We also have people that deal with the various types of caterpillars. Uh, bill bugs, especially in lawn care and sometimes in sport turf, is, is turning out to be a major pest and almost equivalent to white grubs in some areas. Of course, there are chinch bugs, and we have the, the ever-present uh, nuisance pest. I guess before we, we really get started, uh, being an academic, I always have to, to point out that there are many uh, what I consider to be approaches uh, for management of the white grubs, and, and one of the first ones is uh, tolerance. Uh, and I know this is easy for me to say, but can be very difficult for a lawn care company to explain to their customer when that customer digs in their flower bed and finds a grub or two, uh, and they, they wonder, well, you know, why didn't you control my grubs? Well, there, there's a difference between the, the white grubs in a flower bed and in the lawn. And the other thing is just because you dug up uh, several square foot uh, of turf or, or uh, soil and found two or three grubs, that's not enough. Uh, there, you really need grubs typically in turf somewhere uh, in the, the 8 to 10 grubs per square foot before you'd really achieve damage. Now, unfortunately, we haven't told the skunks and raccoons and armadillos that. Uh, and, and in those cases, if you have maybe five grubs uh, per square foot, uh, they might come in and, and root or root your uh, turf. Uh, and in that case, uh, we, we have to deal with the animals. We're specifically here today to talk about preventing grubs. And, and what we're talking about here is using the residual lifespan of the insecticides that we apply to the turf uh, and, and so even though we know that most white grub populations arrive in July and August over most of the, the turf uh, growing areas in North America, some of these insecticides have residual activities of, of three to four months, and so we can apply them earlier uh, to prevent those uh, grub infestations from happening. And we also have to realize that uh, we do occasionally uh, run into grub infestations that weren't treated, so we need some curative treatments. And heaven forbid that we might run into the rescue treatments. Uh, those are the ones that I talk about. Uh, I call them the big, fat, and sassy land shrimp stage, uh, which are, are usually there late in the season, and the animals are starting to dig them up. And we really need to, to start working on that quickly. I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time on all the different species of white grubs, uh, but in general, remember that we have three major white grub groups in, in North America. The vast majority of our white grub species are what we call annual white grubs. These are ones that take one year to complete their life cycle. But in certain areas, especially on golf courses, uh, we do have uh, both the black turfgrass atenius and aphodia species, which can complete multiple generations. Uh, we're seeing out in California that there's a, a couple of uh, aphodia species that may have three to four generations in a, in a particular season. And right now, at least in, in most of North America, the May-June beetles are coming out. And in the northern part of their range, uh, many of those uh, white grub species take three to five years to complete their uh, life cycle. But there are May-June beetle species that live down from uh, in, in southern uh, California across uh, through Texas and, and the Gulf states. Uh, that are what we call annual uh, uh, May-June beetle species. They can complete their life cycle in one year. Now with that said, of course, uh, entomologists always spend a lot of time talking about identification of the different white grub species. And in the past, uh, many of the insecticides that we used uh, when we only were dealing with mass chafers and Japanese beetles, it was really kind of irrelevant uh, knowing the different species. But life has gotten more complicated uh, across our turf grass uh, growing regions. And, and when you're dealing with things like European chafer or oriental beetle, 
we know that many of those particular species seems to have a, a uh, they, they just seem to be more resistant to some of the insecticides that we apply. And with those particular types of, of uh, grubs that are more difficult to control, you may need to apply your insecticide a bit closer to the time that you expect those little first instar grubs uh, to be there. Now, speaking of the first instar grubs, uh, remember that all white grubs, uh, whether they're the green June beetles that you find in the, the southern part of the, the United States or the mass chafers, uh, Japanese beetles in the northern parts of the zones, they all have this complete life cycle. And in this complete life cycle, they have three or they have four stages. They have an egg stage, a larval stage, a pupal stage, and an adult stage. And the larval stage is our target, and that larval stage is divided into three substages that we call instars. Now, in this particular image, you can see that the little first instar grub that's just hatched out of the egg is really quite small. And being very small, it's very susceptible to our insecticides. And so the reality is we have to think, uh, when can I get the maximum amount of my active ingredient of my insecticide into the soil thatch interface at the time that that little first instar grub hatches out of its egg and moves up into the soil thatch interface to start feeding. On the other hand, if I wait until I get those big, fat, and sassy third instar uh, white grubs, I often joke with people, you almost need a sledgehammer to kill those rascals because uh, just in body weight, the first instar grub, if we, we say that's a unit of one, the third instar grub can be a unit of 30 to 50 times that body weight. And, and so you can see it would take a lot more insecticide to kill them. Now, another thing that I also like to point out, I, I noticed we had a, quite a few questions about, uh, you know, why do white grub populations seem to rise and fall, and why are some years worse than other years? It's been our experience, as uh, most of the turf entomologists agree, that this is usually dependent on soil moisture, and more importantly, it's dependent on the soil moisture at the time that these white grubs lay their eggs. And in this particular image, you can see there's a mass chafer egg that has just been laid, and it actually is, is more egg shape. But those eggs, if they are laid in moist soil, will ab absorb moisture from that soil typically in about 12 to 24 hours. Uh, and as you can see, it, it almost doubles in size. And what we find is that if you've got white grubs that are forced to lay their eggs in dry soil. And you might wonder, well, how dry does it have to be? Well, it has to be at wilting point of the turf grass. And it's one of the reasons why I tell homeowners uh, that they're afraid that their lawn's going to go dormant in the summertime. And I say, just go ahead, let it go dormant. That's perfectly all right. And as a matter of fact, if you let your turf go dormant in that July and August window, you'll probably be much less susceptible uh, to white grubs. Now, another thing that's not illustrated on this particular slide is the other major factor that seems to influence white grub populations, and that's the amount of organic matter that's in the turf. Uh, and, and the principal organic matter that we're talking about is the thatch. And so, again, one of the things that we found is that in recently seeded or sodded turf, we almost never have a white grub infestation until about the third, fourth, or fifth year. And when we do analysis of that, what we find is that the turf has to establish a thatch layer. And typically, uh, when you get thatch layers that are 3 eighths of an inch, half inch, or even more, that turf is now suitable uh, for the white grub uh, infestations. Now, I also uh, remember I showed you the, the life cycle or the life stages of the white grubs, and we really now have to kind of put that into, if we're talking about the annual white grubs, and I've just picked the mass chafer as my example, when do those different stages occur over the season? And in this particular image, you can see that uh, the adults fly typically in June and July, and, and after mating, they'll go back into the turf and lay their eggs. And so for most of the white grub species that are annual white grubs, it's usually somewhere in late June, July, and early August that they're laying eggs. Obviously a little bit earlier typically in the southern states and a little bit later in the northern states. But what that usually means is that in most of the areas where we're managing turf, those first instar white grubs are usually in the turf from about mid-July to mid-August. 
And in this particular uh, image, what I've put in there is I've got an insecticide that, let's say, has a residual activity of two and a half to three months. That means I've got a pretty wide window uh, that I can apply that. And in this particular case, if I apply that insecticide, let's say, in, in late May, I'm really not targeting the white grubs that are there. The grubs at that point in time are actually pupae and would not be susceptible to that insecticide. But what I'm expecting is that insecticide's residual activity will remain in the soil thatch interface until that mid-July, early August window. And so when the little first instars come up to the surface and start to feed, that area is laced with this insecticide and will take them out. On the other hand, we find that uh, we still can cure uh, infestations, and many of the insecticides that we use as prevention can actually cure. And when I say cure, we're talking about uh, probably second instar white grubs that are in the turf. And, and I'm going to show you some data here in a few minutes that indicates that, indeed, many of the insecticides that we can use as preventives can also be used as early curatives. On the other hand, what we find is that if you don't discover those white grubs until they're the big third instar white grubs that are very difficult to control, now we're in the rescue mode. And in that particular case, we find there are really very few insecticides that have the activity against these uh, larger larvae. Uh, and some of the key issues when you're dealing with this rescue mode is that in many areas of the country, the grubs may have stopped feeding, uh, especially in the fall. If you've got Japanese beetles or mass chafers that have completed their development, they may still be fairly close to the soil surface level, but they've stopped feeding. And if they're not ingesting the insecticide, it makes it very difficult for the, the insecticide to have any kind of contact activity. Same thing can occur in the springtime. We find that the grubs uh, come to the surface in the springtime over a period of time, and sometimes uh, they may be feeding, they may not be feeding, uh, and, and they're coming up at various times. So in the, the spring curative or rescue treatments can also be uh, quite difficult. Now, we're not going to have a, a lot of time to talk about all of the products, but I do want to point out that we do have uh, some, some newer insecticide, and, and I call these tools. They're sort of the, the tools that we have uh, in, in our tool chest. A lot of people have been asking, do we have any biological controls? And my feeling is, is true biological controls, such as the insect parasitic nematodes and some of the diseases, uh, really are, are probably out of the, the range of this discussion because they're really only used as curative uh, types of materials. But we do have uh, an interesting product. It's a new BT product, and, and in this case, you're actually using a bio-based toxin from Bacillus thuringiensis, and, and we've had some activity with this one, especially when grub gone is applied, uh, when the, the white grubs are first instars or early second instars, we've seen to have some pretty good activity. So it's almost more of a early curative control rather than uh, to be used as a preventive control. Now I'm gonna switch into the, the uh, uh, more standard products that I think most of you are familiar with, and the first ones are the Neonix, uh, the neonicotinoids include primarily imidacloprid, thiamethoxam, clothianidin, and dinotefuron, and I've given you the, the trade names for those. Obviously, the first one to hit the market was imidacloprid or merit. This is uh, still easily available. Uh, thiamethoxam was, was another one, and, and then clothianidin under the, the name of, of uh, Arena. Now, uh, I have to I apologize for this. Remember that Valent sold this product to New Farm, and so New Farm uh, is, is the owner and marketer of the arena. The latest of the Neonic to, to hit the market was Xylam, and, and it's been our uh, studies that, that have indicated that Dinotefuron is probably the least long residual of the Neonics. Uh, if I put the residual activity of these in here, uh, imidacloprid and thiamethoxam appear to, to last for about two months, uh, so they have two months of effective residual. Clothianidin in our studies and in many other studies that I've seen has the longest residual activity of the neonics, uh, typically three months of activity. 
And dinotefuron probably has one month and maybe even less uh, activity. And, and so if you think about that uh, calendar that I had with the white grub uh, application or the, the white grub activity, you can think about when you might apply those. Some of the uh, other materials that we have uh, in the non-neonics, uh, the newest kit on the block is, is a celebrant or chlorhydronilaprol. Uh, this is a material that we, in our studies, has actually given us four months of control. And we've actually been applying a celebrant as early as, as April, uh, the first and second week of April, yet our target are the white grubs that arrive in July and August. And, and we've been getting very good control with those. Some of the more older uh, products, Mach 2, I've just learned recently that Dow has, has taken that off the market, though they're still selling out uh, product. Seven or Carboreal is still available as, uh, in some of the products. Uh, that's one of the, the older materials. But again, it has a very short residual activity. Uh, and Dilox, likewise, has a very short uh, residual activity. So when we're talking about these, uh, the, the seven and the Dilox products are really our curative uh, insecticides and, and are not to be used in a preventive mode. Now, I uh, also wanted to, to mention that there are a couple of combination products that, that uh, have been out there. Uh, uh, some uh, people are, are uh, shifting these around, but uh, we've seen things like Aloft, Duocide, and Maxide. My feeling is, is that it's really the primary active ingredient that is used in these for grub control. Usually the secondary products in here, which are pyrethroids, are primarily just for surface insect uh, uh, control and, and really isn't important to us for white grub control. Well, let's get to, to the actual data uh, that, that we might have uh, for this. And I sort of keep a running tally of all the research reports uh, that have been published on uh, white grub efficacy. So anytime my fellow entomologist or other entomologist uh, uh, publish data on the efficacy of a particular grub insecticide, I capture those data and, and put them in this table. Now, the way I want you to take a look at this table, and, and we'll break this out uh, here in a minute, but if you look at this table, what I mean is that uh, in that May column, any of the insecticides that were applied any time in the month of May, that's the average control that was achieved. And, and uh, we'll take a, a closer look at these in, in a minute. Same thing with the June to the July. Now, you might wonder, well, why, why did I go to, to the, sort of this August 16th? Well, typically that's about the time that most of the first instar white grubs are starting to change into the second instar. So what I'm really talking about is this is an application made as a curative from that late July to the mid-August for first instar white grubs. And then likewise, from that mid-August to that early September, that would be the time that we would be applying these actually as a curative for second instar white grubs. Well, as I stated, uh, let, let's sort of break these out and let's just take a look at the, the May data. And, and I think it's, uh, to me, it's very interesting. Remember I told you earlier that imidacloprid and thiamethoxam usually only have about a two-month residual activity. So if it's applied in May, but my target is at the end of July or early part of August, that reaches sort of the end of that two months. And if you take a look at those, you'll notice that we don't achieve what I consider to be effective uh, control of white grubs, which is at least 90% control. And so when you use imidacloprid or thiamethoxam, especially at their normal label rates, they're not going to achieve the kind of control that you want to have. On the other hand, if we take a look at our third uh, neonicotinoid, the clothianidin or arena, notice that that one does hang in and hangs in quite well. And that's why I indicated that when you're using a clothianidin product, you're probably going to get three months of effective residual. And of course, the, the acelebrin, the chlorantronilaprol, uh, as I indicated before, we've even uh, applied that in April. Uh, that one also gives you very satisfactory control with those May applications. Now, if we move into the, the June application window, uh, what we find is, is that, uh, hold on here, and. Uh, See. I'm not sure that's that's moving into the next one.
Okay. Uh, we seem to, to have kind of a, a glitch. I don't know if, if our moderators can help me uh, advance the slide there and move into the, the uh, next month. Okay, there we are with June. Uh, and, and when we get into June, what we find is is that virtually all of the, uh, uh, I guess we've skipped into June. I, I'll tell you what June is. June is all of the uh, typically registered grub insecticides uh, give us that 90% control. That, that's fine. When we move into July, uh, likewise, uh, you, you can choose the product. Uh, any of these products are going to give you uh, excellent control at, at that time. Now, as we move into the, uh, you know, from, from late July into early August, uh, what we find in, in those particular cases is, is that, uh, yes, uh, virtually all of these insecticides work uh, quite well for us. So if we think about this, all of the currently registered grub insecticides work quite well for us in the application of June, July, and early August. If you want to stretch that out further, then you're going to have to use something like uh, Arena, uh, the Clothianidin, or the Acelaprin, the Chlorantranilaprol. Now, as I move into August, uh, notice something kind of interesting on this chart. We don't see any data for the Acelaprin or the Chlorantranilaprol, and, and you might wonder, well, what's going on? Uh, basically, DuPont that first developed this and Syngenta that now owns this uh, have recognized that as far as they're concerned, the acelaprin has very little or very poor curative capability, and they didn't even want it to be tested uh, during that window. But if we take a look at our other neonicotinoids, the, the uh, clothianidin, uh, the imidacloprid, and, and the uh, uh, thiamethoxam, uh, those are holding in uh, quite well for us. And, and we do have more data, especially uh, on the clothianidin during that uh, time period. Now, in this next slide, this is, uh, remember, now we're dealing with second instar white grub, so it's really kind of out of, of our window, and, and this one, instead of being a preventive, this is moving into the curative mode, and as we see here, again, virtually all the neonicotinoids uh, hold in quite well. They're giving us uh, the, the levels of control that we'd like to see, a little bit of drop-off maybe with the thiamethoxam. A uh, little bit of dry uh, uh, drop off with the clothianidin, but if you use the full label rate, uh, it should get in there pretty well. Now, what I'd like to do is is give you some data uh, on some of these newer products, and and the problem that I have in putting these in the table at this point in time is that we really only have a couple of data points uh, for this one. But I did want to uh, mention to you. Uh, the people that, that are looking for some of the bio-based alternative products. Uh, in this particular study in, in 2011, we used the, the BT product in the Grub Gone. We applied it actually as a preventive in, in uh, late June, uh, what I would call a, a really late preventive in mid-July, and then as a early curative uh, in early August. And if you'll notice, uh, you know, we're not getting that 90% control, which I'd like to see, but it's been my experience that uh, for any of the, the biologicals or bio-based materials, uh, getting 75% uh, control or better uh, is probably the best that you're going to get for those. Now, of course, when you compare that uh, with, with the standard uh, neonicotinoids such as Grub-X, which contains imidacloprid, and Meridian, which contains thiamethoxam, uh, those, those are giving us uh, better control uh, levels with those. Here's another one talking about acelaprin. As I mentioned to you, acelaprin, is, uh, we've been applying that one as early as April. Uh, and, and again, you can see that uh, at various rates, uh, fairly early in the season, uh, we're still getting uh, excellent control. And in this particular study, we were actually pretty uh, uh, pleased with that. Uh, and it, if you take a look at, at when you compare that with Merit, which was applied in mid-July, uh, and, and you're getting that same level of control with the normal label rates of, of material in early April, uh, that's quite good. <coughs> Excuse me. In this particular study, uh, this is another one that, that um, people are asking. <clears throat> Excuse me if they can, might be able to use a celeprin, uh at um, 
uh, you know, lower rates. Uh, we were, we've been trying that, and, and remember that uh, Syngenta is not going to support this, but we've been able, when we apply a celeprin at uh, three-quarter rates and even at half rates uh, in that uh, uh, late June, early July window, we've achieved what I consider to be satisfactory grub control. Well, I'm going to move on uh, through the, the rest of these slides. Um, you know, we always get questions, uh, even though it's not the topic of this particular uh, uh, webinar about uh, uh, preventive controls, what do we do with rescue treatments, and it's been our experience that Dilox is still primarily the material that, that the industry uses, but in our studies we've seen that clothianidin uh, or arena does have some very significant uh, curative uh, capabilities, and in most of our studies it's been almost uh, equivalent uh, to the Dilox for those uh, rescue treatments. Uh, late in the season. Likewise, people are, are asking for the, the organic or non-pesticide materials, and again, it's been our experience that the milky disease are a waste of time and money, so are the fungal diseases that are out there. They, we see uh, very uh, low levels of control and or no control whatsoever. The insect parasitic nematodes are out there, but they're fairly expensive, and you've got to make sure that you're working with extremely fresh material uh, and, and so you'll need to make arrangements for that uh, particular supplier. So that sort of ends up uh, my uh, particular discussion, and, and uh, I'll be monitoring the questions and answers and, and try to help you out with those uh, as we go along. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. That was excellent information. We really appreciate it. Um, just a reminder to the audience, if you have questions, you can type them into the Q&A box, and we will address those all at the end. Um, and with that, we'll bring on Brad DeBelt from Weedman Lawn Care to give his portion of the presentation. Great. Uh, I think David provided a heck of a lot of really good information there, um, definitely a lot on products, and we'll touch on some of that uh, towards the end of my presentation as well here. Um, I find uh, my background in research and things very interesting because I'm sure Dave would attest when they go out and do some of these uh, research projects and things, they may be uh, measuring the amount of product they put down and maybe grams or, you know, tenths of a pound and things like that uh, for very small areas. And now uh, with a lawn care company, we're measuring uh, the amount of grub control we put down in tons or multiple tons. Uh, so immediately I think, wow, that must be a really big price difference. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of products out there and a lot of the things that uh, we need to be concerned about the grubs, the turf, the customer. Uh, we really need to be thinking about the dollars as well and the impact that might have on our overall budget, the impact that might have on our yearly revenue. So uh, today, really what I wanted to talk about was starting you know, from the beginning and what is it going to take uh, for us to have a successful grub control season. And it starts off with the marketing. How are we informing our customers about the products that we are offering uh, it comes down to selling. Are we able to sell these products to our customers? Are we able to sell them the idea and the importance of controlling grubs? Once we've uh, taken care of that, are we able to schedule these things in an efficient manner so that uh, we can get our technicians out there with the proper timing, uh, with the proper products? Uh, choosing a rate, you saw quite the list of products uh, that Dave presented there. So how are we going to choose the proper rate and choose the proper product that's going to fit our needs? And, and then probably the most important thing for me is that uh, in our industry, the customers really are what make it, and it's really important for them to have the proper expectations of what uh, we're going to be doing on their lawn, proper expectations of those products. And, and really, we have to be very good at communication, whether that's over the phone or whether that's uh, through emails or door-to-door -door, uh, with these folks. But communication is extremely important, uh, not only with grub control, but probably every other service that your company offers. Uh, and then I'll finish up here with just a few little general tips that I found helpful uh, in the few years that I've been uh, with the company and a few things I can share with you there. So marketing, uh, you know, who, some of us uh, have marketing teams that might be going out and visiting with customers. Uh, some of us, the marketing team may be ourselves, uh, just going out and visiting with folks when we're on lawns uh, or maybe neighbors that happen to see us out servicing one of our customers. And I write sense of urgency on there because 
Uh, I think it's extremely important that as a lawn care company, you go out there and you start talking with customers early about the grub issues. If we try to go up there and just all of a sudden randomly sell them a grub product, uh, I don't know that we're going to be very successful. So we really need to make sure uh, that we're speaking to these customers right away, as soon as we get them on the phone, as soon as they start to interact with us regarding lawn care. And how can we market some of our selling campaigns uh, to these folks? How are they going to know when we might be bringing up these topics? Uh, so I think really being transparent with them and letting them know that you might be giving them a call, you might be talking with them. Uh, as Dave showed, maybe it'll be in the spring uh, to try to uh, get some of these grubs that are left over from the previous year. Maybe it'll be uh, later in the summer when we're starting to see a little bit more egg hatch or these adults flying around around the 4th of July. Um, and then we want to make sure that we're marketing the selling points that we're going to touch upon. Uh, we, once again, we want to make sure that we're getting out ahead of the issues that we might see. So make sure we talk about the adults. Make sure we talk about the grubs. Because you may have services that uh, control grubs, but you might also have services that control, control some of the adults as well, uh, which may help that customer out in the long term. And then uh, customer renewal strategies, I think, is extremely important. Uh, a lot of us uh, in the lawn care industry are selling the same product over and over to the same customer year after year. And so we really want to get the customers to buy in why it's important uh, to talk about grubs every single year and consider having a grub control every single year. Uh, something that I was going to talk about later as well is that uh, it's almost a lot like car insurance. If you go out there and you have a lot of damage uh, to your lawn, it's too late. We don't buy car insurance after we get in an accident, so why would we want to try to think about grub controls after 50, 60, 70 percent of our lawn is seeing damage from those particular insects? Maybe it's even worse than you're seeing damage from uh, some of the larger animals that like to feed on those insects. So how are we going to market then through the technical team or say our technicians out in the field? It's going to be a little bit different uh, than maybe our selling team or our administration team and the fact that we are able to be out there face-to-face -face with these, these folks. I've always found that the marketing and the selling by the technicians is quite a bit easier uh, because of those in-person conversations. So same as the marketing teams, the timing in which your guys are going out there and having these conversations is really important. I think the early or kind of the late spring, very early summer is just as important as the mid or late summer when you're seeing a lot of the adults or maybe you're seeing a, the large amount of damage from the larger larvae that you have in the soil profile. Uh, one thing that we like to do as a company is uh, we'll start leaving fact sheets behind with our customers. And this is a way to get them educated on what some of the issues may be when it comes up. So if they happen to see something in their lawn, they're able to give us a call. Uh, or if nothing else, they're able to help us prevent a few of the issues. Uh, whether that's allowing the soil to go dormant, whether that's adding a little bit of soil moisture maybe to help uh, alleviate some of the root damage that you're getting from those larvae. Um, but really, it's just about customer awareness and making sure they understand what's hap excuse me, happening on their lawn uh, and also making sure that they're aware on how they can communicate with us so that they can have a good year and not see a lot of damage from those grubs. So now that we've got everything marketed, how in the heck do we sell these things? Um, it can be really challenging to decide uh, maybe when you want to run a campaign, when do you want your technicians to focus on this, because they're extremely busy, uh, especially this time of year when uh, maybe you're trying to finish up on that weed control and you're trying to get all those things taken care of and you have customers calling in asking, where is that weed control? Uh, so it's really important that uh, I think this time of the year you get out ahead of it and you try to start talking with your customers regarding grub control. And you really need to have that preventative versus curative discussion. Uh, some folks, like I said, like that insurance policy and they like to make sure that year after year their lawn is protected. So a preventative measure is really where they want to be. You know, in northern Wisconsin, we're starting to think about getting a lot of those preventative applications down now. Um, otherwise, there are always curative applications, and you're also uh, going to start uh, getting curative applications out right now, and you're going to want to make sure that you see damage uh, before you go and apply those applications. So the sales team is going to have to do a very good job of identifying, is this a customer that has an issue now and that we need to be out within a week to take care of, or is this a customer that may have a problem uh, months down the road where we want to put a preventative application out? So that's where I mentioned uh, the visible damage to the lawn, and what should the technicians be doing? And one of the biggest things I see where lawn care companies fail is making sure that the communication between the sales team, the administration team, the marketing team, and the production team 
are all working in unison, we want to make sure that those sales folks that are on the phones understand what those technicians are seeing. Maybe that's an email uh, every once in a while. Maybe that's just stopping by and having a chat once in a while. But we really want to make sure that the sales team has good confidence in what's going on out on these lawns and that we're not trying – uh, to, tell, to sell something to customers that just isn't happening. Uh, maybe it's just knowledge of the weather or weather conditions or knowledge of what grubs they're seeing or just knowledge of overall health of the lawns. Then I want to discuss quickly selling to current customers for our sales teams. Uh, it's a lot different than maybe selling to a new customer that has never had uh, any sort of grub control at all. Uh, maybe these customers are already educated and they understand it. So if they haven't had one in previous years, uh, it takes a lot of effort to make sure they're aware of the possible damage that can happen. I've always liked uh, using kind of the analogy of what it would cost to resod a lawn. Uh, some folks are spending two, three, four thousand dollars to resod lawns. Uh, you know, it may cost that much as well to reseed an entire lawn. Uh, in the picture that uh, Dave showed earlier with the raccoon damage, you get a lot of skunk damage. Uh, it will cost that to replace all of that turf. And, and then the technical team. I've always found that uh, the face-to-face -face selling with our technical team, if you can get out there and properly train those technicians, they can be extremely successful. Uh, one of the important parts is being able to motivate your folks to do that and make sure they're having the right conversations. I always remember uh, a story where we were out with a technician and we started talking with that customer and the customer kind of you know, had that closed-door policy talking to you through the screen door. And the real challenge is how do you get that customer now to be out in the field with you, to come out and walk the lawn? And one of our managers was with, and he got that customer to come out and talk to him on the lawn, you know, ask him some questions, see how things were going, and was able to sell them a grub control. And once the, the service was over, the technician looked at him and said, wow, I cannot believe you were able to do that. I would have never gotten any words out of that guy even. Um, so it just really shows making our guys comfortable and training them with the, for the proper conversations is extremely important uh, in getting out and selling some of these grub controls out there. One thing we like to do as a company is we always leave behind some notes for our customer. Any conditions that we see on the lawn, whether it's weeds, products we're putting down, uh, you know, maybe their landscaping looks really nice or they're, you know, they just wash their car, whatever it happens to be. Uh, but always leave some information if you happen to see some grub damage out there, um, if you happen to see some grub damage at the neighbor's place when you're out servicing that property. It's important that uh, we keep the customer well notified of the conditions that are out there. And then we also like to make sure that we give our customers a call on the phone. Folks that we see damage on the property, we want to make sure that we get out there right away and manage that situation. If we go out there and we apply maybe a fertilizer or weed control and move on, we're going to be getting a call in a week or two with a very upset customer that we didn't do anything. So we want to make sure that our technicians are calling those customers back immediately that evening. Uh, maybe it's even uh, a couple of times that they have to uh, try to get in touch with these customers because it's very important uh, that you're out there and you're managing those folks' lawns and that you can ease some of the burden that they may have uh, from trying to diagnose a lot of those issues. So I probably won't spend a lot of time on choosing the product and rates. I think uh, Dave did a fantastic job of going over a lot of that uh, and all of the different products that are out there. Um, once again, for us, a lot of it uh, is whether you're looking at a curative versus a preventative. There's some different products out there. Uh, you know, I know Arena does a fantastic job. There's some uh, preventative in there as well as the curative, so that really makes for a great product. Um, but it's also uh, curatives can, you know, you can use a different product. Maybe you can save some cost there uh, right to the bottom line if you can find a different product that you can get very good results from. And we also want to keep in mind when we're looking at products, are we trying to control anything else? I've seen a lot of customers that uh, are very happy with maybe some control of some of the ants or some of those pest type insects that are out there. So that may play a large role into the type of products that you like to apply on your customers' lawns. Uh, and as Dave was talking about as well, the length of the desired control, uh, you know, make sure uh, you're applying the correct rates. Not always uh, more is better sort of situation, and not always more is going more uh, pesticide is going to get you longer control. So you want to make sure that you guys uh, have those technicians uh, applying at the proper rates. <clears throat> excuse me, and you have them well trained. Um, one of the biggest issues uh, we'll run into 
If you have a technician that's not properly trained, maybe they won't put enough grub control out there and you won't get the control that you desire and then you run into a season-long issue with your customer. And on the other hand, if they apply way too much, once again, it starts to get expensive. So we really need to make sure uh, that we're really hitting those proper rates uh, for both ends of the budget. So scheduling these applications. Once again, as I mentioned in the beginning, it's extremely busy this time of year. We're you know, trying to tackle a lot of the weed issues that we're running into. Uh, so going out and maybe applying grub controls isn't on the top of your list, uh, especially maybe if you uh, have a lot of new customers that have a lot of weeds, uh, you need to get out there right away. So once again, make sure your guys are properly trained. Do this in the beginning of the year and do it again before you go out and make these applications. And uh, as Dave said, the time of the year is extremely critical because each insect may have a controllable phase at a different time. If this is an insect that has that yearly generation, you know, we may see issues at this time of year. Maybe if it's a little bit drier and there's, uh, you know, that root damage is causing a larger uh, negative impact. Uh, and then as well, uh, we might have to go out uh, later in the summer, maybe it's July or August, when we start to see kind of that second phase of larva damage the turf. Uh, and know uh, what that life cycle is because of that, you know, uh, whether that insect has a one-year life cycle, two, three, or four years. And once again, the importance of irrigation or rainfall, as David was saying, those insects are down below the surface. If we go out and apply a uh, insect control on the surface and we don't get that product watered in, it's not going to have any impact on those grubs that are below the soil surface. So if you're going to see a product that fails, it's be going to be because of that, that it did not get down into that soil profile. So a lot of times what we'll do is if we notice that, uh, you know, today is Thursday, that Friday is going to be a rain day, it's just not looking very good, not conducive for applying weed control, we'll go ahead and book a lot of the uh, grub controls for that day and we'll just go ahead and apply those in the rain. And to be honest, a lot of times the customers really love it when that happens because now they don't have to worry about trying to water in, you know, five or 10,000 square feet of grub control. And I wanted to just to touch upon, you know, a few of the tools that are available. How are we going to determine when we want to go out with this? We keep talking about the time of the year, uh, you know, types of products that we can choose. And probably the biggest fear is, am I going out at the wrong time of the year with the wrong product, wasting my time and wasting my money? And so there's a few different uh, things that are out there. You uh, can always go out. Uh, maybe you're just measuring soil temperatures. When these grubs uh, become active, you're starting to see those soil temperatures rise. Uh, maybe you can use something uh, similar to growing degree days, which is basically just an accumulation of, uh, of values where it's measuring daytime average temperatures. Uh, and as those increase, it accumulates the growing degree days and can give us a really good idea of when some of these insects may be a problem. This particular one is a screenshot that I took uh, from the UW or University of Wisconsin's uh, information site. And basically what we're looking at here is uh, when the adults are going to start to emerge. So if we know when the adults are going to start to emerge, we may want to start thinking about getting a preventative application out there so that we can uh, prevent those eggs from hatching into that larva or we're going to start to see a lot of damage. I find this is a fantastic tool. There's other similar ones, whether, you know, weeds and all sorts of other things like that, but uh, can be very valuable as far as trying to identify when and if we need to start controlling those grubs. Uh, a few of the other, uh, one of the other tools that I wanted to mention uh, was some of these traps, these pheromone traps uh, that folks use. I always uh, remember seeing these in customers' lawns in the past, and they'd be hanging in the trees, and beknownst to them, all they're doing is attracting more and more insects. Uh, a few years back, we were collecting some of, uh, some of the Japanese beetles for a research project, and I recall being able to collect thousands of beetles a day uh, to put into these studies. Uh, it's a little alarming when you see these in the home lawns that folks are really trying to control an insect like this, but in turn, all they're doing is attracting them uh, to their property. So anytime you see one of these out there on your customer's lawns, I strongly encourage you to go over there and suggest that they remove it, uh, or maybe if they don't like their neighbor, they can go ahead and put it in their lawn for the summer. 
but as I mentioned, I think uh, probably the most important part uh, of what we do as lawn care as a lawn care industry is, you know, we need to choose the right products. We need to make sure we're going out at the right rates, following the laws, uh, and really providing a quality product. But really, we need to be communicating well with our customers, making sure they understand what the expectations are of the products and the services we're providing. And uh, we need to make sure that we've educated our technicians so that they're able to identify these early signs of activity. If it's this time of year, maybe it's just a few brown spots. Uh, you'd hate to have technicians out there always assuming that uh, those spots are caused from drought or even the other way, assuming that it's always grubs. Uh, some of these applications can be very expensive, and if a customer finds that they're not useful, it's really going to hurt your revenue in the long term. Uh, we really like to make sure that customers aren't mowing after applications as well. Uh, it's really important that you discuss this maybe during the sale, and also, like I said, when we leave notes behind for our customers, it's always something that we stress. Uh, we always like to talk about being able to control uh, some of these grubs before they even get there. Can we control some of these adults on our property? Uh, there's some great products out there uh, where you get very good control uh, for well more than a month uh, on some of the adults if they happen to have a lot of ornamental viburnums along the house, um, a lot of lindens and things like that in their yard, uh, which really attract some of the adult uh, adult versions of these grubs. And once again, rainfall is a good thing. Uh, customers see you out there applying products in the rain and they get generally concerned because they always think about uh, weed control. So they don't realize that that grub control is a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic approach to get that out in the rain and it's really helping them out in the long term. Um, and re-entry intervals, I always find that folks kind of forget about these. Uh, generally, it's not much of an issue, but uh, we want to make sure that the customers aren't out there uh, while we're making the application, but usually shortly thereafter, they're in pretty good shape and they can be out on the lawn. Uh, and just kind of have a, a note as well is uh, regarding mowing is uh, not only do we not want them mowing and damaging those particular products that are out in the field, uh, we also want to make sure that we're leaving those clippings behind. And uh, one for the products that are applied, but uh, also on a nutrient standpoint, that if we're leaving those clippings, uh, at least in the Midwest, we're talking about maybe a 20 to 30 percent addition of nutrient uh, back to the soil and back to those plants. So it's really a cost-saving measure for them, also a good measure to make sure we're uh, being safe with those products and not damaging them. And just a few uh, a quick general tips uh, that I think kind of help us out uh, overall as far as grub, grub control is concerned with uh, the, lot, the lawn industry um, is, like I said in the beginning, is we really need to make sure that the customers are thinking about this uh, as really as an insurance policy for their lawn and describing how expensive it can be when we get that damage. Um, you know, we'd always hate to see, you know, example I like to use is we had a customer that put in a lot of uh, brand new sod and uh, the reason they did is they're having a lot of family coming over in the in uh, late summer uh, and you really don't want to risk seeing a lot of damage from these grubs and you want to make sure that these uh, folks see the perceived value and that's what it's all about is that if they're going to pay you a few hundred dollars for an application we need to make sure that they're satisfied with that application and satisfied with those results and one thing I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is resistance management with these is uh, I'm always concerned about the applications that we put down, uh, especially to living uh, things like insects, is that if we continue to reapply, reapply the same active ingredient all the time to lawns, uh, what is that going to cause maybe 5, 10, 20 years down the road? Is that product no longer going to be useful? And what are the uh, negative impacts that we might see on lawns economically uh, and aesthetically from those? So as much as you can alternate between the chemistries. I think it's extremely important that you do so uh, and really can be a great benefit long term for your company and for the environment. Uh, and as I mentioned, the pheromone traps, uh, definitely not something that we want to be using. Uh, however, uh, you know, maybe as a, as a way to get back at some of our neighbors or something if we're having any issues with them at all. Uh, so that pretty much uh, cleans up what I wanted to discuss here uh, for you folks. Uh, hopefully you got some great information out of that, and uh, it'll help you out here uh, with your weed control here coming up this season. Or, sorry, grub control this season. Thank you, Brad. That was um, an awesome presentation, great information. Um, and we've got, you know, about six or so minutes left, and um, we can go over if need be to do some Q&A. And we have some audience members who have typed in questions, and then we have folks who um, submitted questions beforehand. 
So um, we'll just get started with that. Um, one that came in, and we'll direct this one um, just to give Brad a little break. We'll direct this one to Dave. Um, <laughs> how do skunks, raccoons, et cetera, know that grubs are present? Are they able to hear them <laughs> feeding, or can they smell them? How do they know they're there? Well, we we think that uh, skunks and raccoons are, are a bit different uh, from each other. Raccoons are actually sort of social animals. Uh, and what we find is that a female raccoon that found a good grub meal, uh, I call them land shrimp, uh, but if they, they found a good grub meal a previous season, she's going to take her pups the next season back to that location. And, and they seem to be pretty good at remembering where they got a good meal of white grubs uh, for at least two and sometimes even three years out. And, and so it's not uncommon that once you've treated for the white grubs and have completely eliminate them, uh, eliminated them, that you might get a little bit of, of just sort of random digging here or there the following year. But that, that's just to be expected with something like a, a raccoon. Uh, the skunks, as far as we're concerned, uh, do apparently use their nose, and, and uh, they've got an extremely good sense of smell. I can't smell a grub, but apparently they can. Uh, and and uh, they'll they'll dig around, and once they find them again, they'll come back. But they're much less social. It's usually a single individual uh, that's uh, rooting around. But the the raccoons can go around like an, almost in a herd, and they can really rototill a, a lawn in in no time in one night. Uh, now there was some some interesting research done a few years ago, and and it does appear that. They have extremely good hearing, and both skunks and raccoons uh, potentially can actually hear the white grubs chewing uh, under the soil and digging uh, under the soil. And, and uh, I saw some video of this where you could see the, the raccoon coming in, and it was, you know, turn one ear and then turn the other ear towards the, a particular area and then start digging in that area, and, and they seem to be pretty good at that. Okay, interesting. Um, I never would have <laughs> even thought to ask that question. <laughs> um, um, here is another one. This is one of the pre-submitted questions, um, which either or both of you may have touched on. But um, what are – there's a couple questions that are kind of related to this, so I thought it was worth asking again. Um, so maybe for this one we'll go to Brad just to, to alternate. Um, what are the – earliest signs of grub activity? And is there anything different specifically regarding damage to turf that um, would indicate the problem is from a white grub and not something else? Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, you know, so, you know, early signs, a lot of times in the spring, you might not ever even see anything. You figure these grubs are damaging the root systems of our turf. So if we happen to be getting adequate rainfall, uh, maybe there's not quite enough damage in that short period uh, before they kind of go back into the soil uh, and start worrying about that pupil stage. Uh, so it's a lot of times it's just looking like drought damage. You might see it to kind of coalesce, keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, a really great way to differentiate it between a lot of maybe diseases that you might see is that you, you really start to see pattern, some patterns with diseases and things, whether it's exact circles and things like that. Grub damage usually isn't an uh, exact circle. and uh, I always tell folks that if you think it's grub damage, go over there and see what it feels like. Grab onto that turf. Uh, a lot of times, just a quick tug, you'll get that turf to come up if it is grub damage, uh, and you'll be able to peel that back just like a, a poorly laid piece of carpet in your home. So I always tell folks if it's grub damage, you'll see grubs there. And like Dave said, two grubs are not enough uh, to cause a lot of damage. You're talking about 10 to 20 grubs per square foot before you start to see a lot of significant damage. And, and okay, I would agree great, with that. Yes. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Uh, the, uh, frankly, I rarely see much grub damage in, in the springtime because many of the grubs have been killed over the winter. Uh, so if, if you had 10, 15 grubs going down in the fall, we rarely see more than maybe five to eight grubs the following spring. Uh, and, and with the turf actively growing, you rarely see much activity. But when we do see the, the grub uh, damage first showing up, uh, at least here in Ohio, it's usually towards the end of July, the early part of, uh, part of August, and it's deceptive because it looks like drought damage. And of course, that's the time that it's hot and dry anyway, 
So everybody's just assuming that it, it's drought damage. And I always tell the, the lawn care folks, don't assume. Uh, and, and you can't do a drive-by diagnosis. You've got to get out of your, your truck. You've got to go over to that lawn, and you've got to pull on the turf and maybe even dig a little bit to, to see if there are some grubs there. Okay, great. That's helpful. Um, a question from the audience is, um, Dave will ask you this one, is there a good practice for controlling white grub and chafers, which occur later and can get missed, resulting in um, damage by targeting white grubs? Yeah, my, uh, and, and this is what I was trying to indicate at, at the beginning of my particular session. It, it, depending on the region that you're in and, and what we're finding right now in the New England states and, and basically from uh, uh, Maryland north uh, up in that corridor, we're seeing a lot of uh, European chafers and oriental beetles that are coming in. My feeling is European chafer is a really strange one. European chafer is really a cold season white grub. And what happens is that it's the first one to emerge as an adult. It actually will emerge in, in the first part of June, lay its eggs. And where we run afoul of this one is that if you make the application of your grub insecticide, let's say in, in July, which would normally be the right time for Japanese beetles or mass chafers, the European chafer goes deep in the soil profile when it gets hot, and then it won't come back up to the surface until the soil cools down again in September and October. And if you've used uh, an insecticide that has a residual of like two months, the grubs weren't there at the time that you had the maximum efficacy of that. And, and so the strategy for that one is to apply it even earlier so that you've got the maximum amount when the first instar grubs arrive in late June, early July. Or the other strategy is wait until they come back up again uh, later on in the season and make sure that you've got the maximum amount of your insecticide in there at that time. Okay, great. And we are over the hour, so we will um, cut it off there. And um, just want to say thank you again to our sponsor, New Farm, and to our presenters. Um, great information. And um, Allison is going to wrap up the webinar. Okay, thank you for attending today's webinar. If you have any more questions, do not hesitate to contact our presenters at the emails on your screen now. Links to their email addresses are in the bios at the left. An on-demand recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow afternoon and will be available online for a full year at landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. If you'd like to share this webinar with your colleagues, you can do so via any of the links on the left-hand side of your screen. You can also download today's slides by clicking on the green folder icon at the bottom right of your dock. If you aren't already a Landscape Management Magazine subscriber, we'd like to invite you to sign up today for free. All you have to do is click on the Landscape Management logo at the bottom right of your doc and fill out a short form. We have one great webinar coming up next month. Our next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, June 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Registration for that event, How TBG Landscape Employees Increase Productivity, sponsored by Caterpillar, is now open. Again, you can register for these upcoming events or view previous ones now at landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. We look forward to seeing you at a future webinar.